Julie's a certified life coach and a certified mentor coach, intuitive consultant and facilitator, and a podcast host and producer with over 15 years experience in the field of coaching, healing, and transformation. She works with creatives, leaders, entrepreneurs, executives, artists, parents, and people interested in their own well-being and that of their families, neighbors, and the planet. Julie supports individuals in trusting their intuition to make better decisions, gain clarity, lead with meaning and purpose, and be a voice of change. Julie supports people in all areas related to leadership and decision-making, career, personal development, and life transitions. She's the host and producer of Julie in Conversation, which is a live weekly podcast featuring best-selling authors, scientists, psychologists, and thought leaders contributing to individual and collective healing and change. She's based in Montreal, Canada, and works with individuals and groups worldwide. I'll introduce myself briefly. Okay, so I'm Elaine Friend. I'm an international consultant on high sensitivity. I've been in the mental health world for about three decades. And um, although when I'm doing these online things, I'm not a therapist. I'm just me with my life experience. I mean, sure, I bring that lens of um, being a family therapist, but I um, and my experience working with highly sensitive families but I'm not your therapist today, just a consultant. And that's how we're both here. We're also, I put somewhere in one of the descriptions, Julie, I said, we're, we're HS moms on the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's for sure. <laughs> that's, we are, we're in the trenches with all of you. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much for being here. So this is a mini workshop, as Julie was saying, and we're, we're here to um, answer any of your questions. I, I think I want to just encourage folks, uh, if you didn't register on the Eventbrite, to go look at the Eventbrite for this event and for our Friday workshop. They're both called Parenting Sensitivity, Behavior and Discipline from Launch to Birth, because uh, we put a bunch of little videos that Julie and I made for our last month's workshop. And um, we answered so many questions and we just got going. That was on emotions and empathy and reactivity. And there's just so much content. We're like, we have to do this again. I love that you suggested that, Julie. Um, but I wanted to say that I always want to make the, these workshops, the subtitle be an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Because when you're having discipline problems and behavior problems with your highly sensitive children, it's almost always preventable. Now, I bet you, you don't believe me because you're in the fray. And it's really hard. And I'm not, I'm not remotely sitting here pretending that I prevented all of it in my family while I was raising my child. No, no way. Um, we were in it all the time and um, still in it. And he's 21. So, um, but I know that it's preventable, just like I know my own behavior problems are preventable by what, you know, having enough rhythm and routine, I guess. But what's not preventable is the patterns that you've developed in your family, right? Once, once you've gotten into a pattern of um, chronic over arousal or a lot of um, the child sort of running the family, that kind of thing, there's not a lot that you can do to prevent those behavior problems. Now you have to go into, you know, really taking some tools and making some changes in your family so that you can get back to an even ground where you can prevent behavior problems. What do you think, Julie? Yeah, it's just the word that came as repair, you know, um, that I agree, you know, even just this morning experiencing like, oh my God, and I'm talking about discipline and he, look at my, there's chaos around me, you know, but I think for me in my process and growth as a parent and as an individual is gaining the insight to understand what is actually happening in my child. And when I can get to the root of the emotion or even understand it, it helps me take a step back and then reassess and then come back in and, you know, um, adjust accordingly my behavior, you know, and my parenting, and then it works, you know, so it's this consistent, you know, checking in and, um, and repairing, you know, whether it's an internal process and my children have no idea that I'm doing it, but it's, it's um, continuous growth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, you, we do get into habits as parents and the children get into habits too, 
And I could just think even not a habit as a parent, let's just all take a moment and think about what is a, a bad habit that you've gotten into or a habit that I don't want to label it bad and good, but a habit that you've developed that is not serving you in your life. But for me, I have a habit of um, managing my overwhelm by going to a screen, which I know increases my overwhelm. But, you know, I've got like three or four little games on my phone. And the research shows actually that you can use adults, not kids. You can use these little games to settle your anxiety, but you have to do it for five minutes, 10 max, and then stop. But you know how they like play a new game. You know, one of my favorites is um, Mahjong, you know, okay. just matching the tiles. It's not the real game of Mahjong, but um, I have Filipino in-laws and was exposed to a lot of Mahjong in, in my young adult lives, life and um, many lives. <laughs> but, so it's not that Mahjong. But that is something that I know overstimulates me. I, and I know I'm not really able to stop at five mm. minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, another thing I do that my therapist points out to me, yeah, I'm near every week is I schedule too much. Mm. It's just, it's a bad habit. It's something mm -hmm. that, you know, my temperament leads me to do. Do you have one, Julie? How to manage my overwhelm. No, a, ha a habit that you've, oh, been, habit. that you've gotten into that's not serving you. Um, well, one that um, like, I'm not a huge TV watcher or I haven't been over my lifetime, but um I've noticed, I've just started watching Schitt's Creek. I don't know if any, you've watched it. Everybody's talking about I've it. I've watched a little bit, but I've been told I must watch it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm Canadian. And so there's extra allegiance to the, the cast and um, the show. And I think what it's like season one and there's eight seasons. And so like, I have to get through them all in one night. Like, how is that supposed to work? You know, so I could see how my temperament, if that's what you want to call it, like, I can't close it, you know? And I need sleep. I usually go to bed pretty early, you know, because sleep is very important to me. But when I get into this, I'm just going to, I need just to stop and like lose myself in this. I'm like, yeah, it's, 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 it's got me. Okay. Well, so let's hear from folks. What are the bad habits that your kids have gotten into? It's just something that um, I think it's not even a habit in my family, but one thing that gets, can start happening is not getting enough sleep. Like since you just brought up sleep, um, the kids can get into a habit of having, you know, pushing bedtime back. And it's, I mean, see the, here the problem, like if you're, especially if you're highly sensitive, but basically my theory is all parents are exhausted by the time bedtime comes around, <laughs> just like the kids. So you don't have your like, your superpower, like, rhythm and routine parent accessible to you. And so they just start, you know, needling and wheedling. And why, I, you know, why is it so hard for them to go to bed? And, and but I know why it's hard for us. I mean, I, I know why it's hard for them too. Um, that <laughs> it's overstimulation, right? They're just over, over when, when you're over aroused, you can't settle. Yeah. That's why, you know, Schitt's Creek and Mahjong are so good, <laughs> right? Because they turn your brain off a little bit right. and into a different place you know, um, but that, that is a, that is a really difficult habit that can start jumping in and ruin behavior the next day. Mm. When I work with parents, one of the things I do early on in our work, um, in our consultation work is I ask them to keep a log for one week of everything that happens and, you know, and just, it's sort of like, okay, um, 6 45 AM wake up. 7 a.m. breakfast, but also then out to the side, they put how the kid is and anything that they ate. And also they have to peek, like after they leave the room, after the bedtime routine, they have to peek in. So, cause I want to know when the child's actually going to sleep, mm -hmm. how long is it taking them to settle? And um, so we kind of, one of the things we do during that time, if at all possible is we keep the door cracked. If the child's used to a closed door, we keep it cracked so you can open it with less noise mm -hmm. and, and sneak in a little peek to see if they're actually asleep or not. Because you, you might think you know, but you know if you haven't been doing that, you don't know. So, um, but it's so hard. But the reason I do that is you can look, everything that happens today is going to come into play tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
So true. You know, that's why. Go ahead. I was going to say it feels that feels like prevention rather than reactivity, like reacting to what set off that cascade of bad behavior, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, Monday, if, if you have a full weekend, Monday's going to be a hard day at school. Mm -hmm. And you have a chill weekend, Monday might be the best day at school. And, you know, it's just like, I would encourage parents to think about, you know, what is the best day at school if your child is school age, in preschool through college? <laughs> if, you, if you can think about what, what day, like at what point are they having their best day? Maybe it's Tuesday, because Monday's a transition back into the environment. And by Tuesday, they're good. And then um, by Wednesday, at the end of school, they're done. So Thursday sucks and Friday's a wash. <laughs> Does anybody relate to that? <laughs> and then when the weekend comes, like I could say that, you know, we had a busy for us Saturday. And so my, one of my sons was thinking about maybe he'd get together with a friend or we'd arrange that. And then I said, maybe you just want the day to unwind and catch up on some homework and just have this unstructured day. And not that there's a lot of structure in the weekend for him, but um, then he just settled into that and realized, yeah, I think that might help because just what you're speaking of over arousal cannot be good leading into a Monday. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just want, I, I know we have someone here with teenagers and um, I want to bring that. Will you tell us the ages of the, the ages of your boys, Julie? 10 and eight. 10 and eight. Almost 11. Um, and, um, I, so I want to speak to the teenager life. There's, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause people have tweens and teens, almost 11. I'm going to call that a tween for sure. Um, you can start to feel the puberty just kind of creeping in. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say one thing for everybody who has children, 11 or younger, 11, more or less, you know, all developmental milestones and, 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 uh, markers are plus or minus a year. But based, so I'm, I'm telling you that, Julie, because you have time. But Thanks. you have to say everything you want to say to your children by the age of 11. Because after that, their peers' voices are equal or louder. I have a month. Yeah. <laughs> no, but plus or minus a month. So go for it for the year. I mean, okay. I'm not kidding. Say everything you've ever wanted to say. Talk about, um, you saw, those of you who saw my recent live video, um, talk about, you know, littered beer cans and what that means and how judgment changes. And if you drink and you feel a little loose, if you have a, a, a cocktail or a glass of wine in front of your children, and you feel a little loose, you say, wow, I'm noticing that I feel, I feel different. And, you know, I, God, this would be a good time to manipulate me to go to bed late because my judgment is off, I, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. but it's saying to really, whatever it is, I, that's just my kind of off the cuff thing. I, I'm always doing paradoxical interventions on my kid. Oh, here, I'll tell you how I kept, before I go to the teenagers, well, this is a teenage intervention. I'll tell you how I kept my child from um, having unprotected sex in high school. Although most highly sensitive children will not have sexual relationships or even steady partners in high school, many, if not most. The reason is we're a little slower to develop and school is so overwhelming. I'll never forget in fifth or sixth grade, my son started going to sleep away camps. And um, one I really loved, he went to great book summer. Wow, is that a fabulous camp? And it, they have it at university. So as early as middle school, um, the children can go for a week to three weeks, and they study great books, and they use a Socratic method. And they're, it's, you know, it sounds boring in a way it is so not they build these little pods of kids, and they discuss and like life while they're discussing a little bit of wow. whatever. And it's very, they do a really nice job of using a diverse um, group. And they, it's not like they read Plato, the entire book, they give them an excerpt and then they make a play about it or they do art about it, or it's just insanely cool. Camp. Oh. Anyway, my highly, highly sensitive boys are very attractive to girls, right? Cause boys in middle school, they're little jerks, right? I, I love boys. They're my, they're my sweet spot, but they aren't really like, they're just so immature and the girls are starting to get really mature and the girls are like, but then you get a sensitive boy who's got like a stronger um, emotional intelligence because of the sensitivity and the girls love that. So this girl at camp started texting him. He had a phone and um, I'm embarrassed to say, I'm a big fan of wait until eight. 
wait until eight. Okay. Eighth. No, eighth. Eighth. Wait, okay. Eighth. I'm like eight. Grade wait. Eight. Am I okay? That's the big movement to wait until eighth grade to for okay. your child the phone. Anyway, but he commuted a long ways, and so he needed to have all he had was text and phone. So regarding phones, don't get them one with the internet until high school. Just only text and phone, like a flip phone. Anyway, this girl was texting him every single day, and he was like, "Oh my gosh." It's so exhausting. I said, that's how girls are. They need a lot of time and attention because they like to connect. They like to talk constantly. So the way you handle that is you actually don't reply every day. You wait a day to reply. Mm -hmm. so anyway, the girls can be um, hard for sensitive boys and actually boys too. Um, Asher's always had um, gay friends who I think were, you know, really having crushes on him and girlfriends gay boy boyfriends and straight girlfriends who were just mystified by the fact mm. that he was a sensitive boy right and so that was appealing well you, you always drop so much practical wisdom that i'm jotting down and you said you had a, but you shared that there, there was a paradoxical intervention around yeah, yeah so thank you for bringing me back i got okay. so lost. so um i said um, this is a paradoxical intervention. If you don't want to have early pregnancy and STDs, STIs, you say, be sure if you get somebody pregnant that they will let me raise the baby. <laughs> Cause I really want to be sure I get a grandchild. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. I always said that to him. I'm like, just make sure if you have sex with somebody that there's someone that I can raise the baby, you know, because if she gets pregnant, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be a baby that's going to be raised by her parents or given up for adoption. I want to raise it. So just be sure you have that conversation with her. So anyway, there was no high school sex for my child. That was your like sex ed intervention. Yeah. I, well, I used to be a sex ed educator, a safer sex educator in my twenties. So he got a lot more and he was more, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Mommy. <laughs> Okay, so for the teenagers, um, you know, they are wanting to be adults now. So younger children are watching what you're doing, but older children are doing what you're doing. So once you have tweens and teens, you have to really watch what you are doing so that they, they emulate you. It's also so helpful to tell them stories curated stories about yourself when you were their age or a little bit older they always want to be older so around and are you already seeing this with your older son that he just wants to be older uh i see it with my younger son actually oh, yeah <laughs> that's because he's a little brother yeah, exactly they, they want to be their their big brother yeah. and then as as children start to hit puberty uh, then they just want to be adults mm. and here's the thing it's very different with girls and boys behavior problems. I have a, um, a family that I work with and the girl is um, newly 13 and all she wants is to be independent. She just wants to make all her own choices. And, you know, one of the, and that is normal for girls, girls from 13 to 15, they're all about differentiating from the family and becoming women. So we have to find things, the way we prevent behavior problems with these girls is we find things that we can do with them that are womanly, that are adult, and also appropriate challenges for boys and girls. You know, like maybe, um, I, I, like I said, I sent my child away to camps at college, on college campuses. That's a great thing because they, they live in a dorm with a roommate, they go to the dining hall, and I think even in fifth grade, he went to orchestra camp on a college campus. He hated it. But, you know, it was a really adulting. You had to travel across campus. You know what college is like when you first get there. So, mm -hmm. um, so girls are extremely difficult, usually from about 13 to 15. It might be different if, for a highly sensitive girl. But I don't feel that I don't see the urge to be independent any different in high sensitivity. And boys just need massive challenges. Girls do too, different kinds. Let's see what questions we're having come in. Julie, you said you had seen one. I have one that relates to the post that you shared, um, speaking of paradoxical intervention on um, high, high sensitivity and alcohol. Mm. You shared it when you were on the walk with your seven-year-old friend and yeah, yeah. her mother and horses and there were beer cans littered 
And so you had this great, you know, insight into how could you intervene right there. And um, so somebody um, was asking, there are usually, you said that there are usually fewer problems with alcohol and highly sensitive children, uh, youth, not children, youth. Um, how do you see the connection between highly sensitive and the sensation seeking characteristic that I see in my highly sensitive child? Lots of research, there's lots of research to say that sensation seeking is highly correlated with alcohol use in young people. And so just curious how you see that. It's a perfect segue because it's kind of what we were just talking about. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, all teenagers are high sensation seeking. Hormones, oh, right. hormones bring it on, you know. I also say all teenagers go through pretty much every personality disorder that's in the diagnostic and statistical manual, right? You're gonna have them be narcissistic. That's a normal teenage st status. You'll see them be avoidant. That's very normal for teenagers. And you'll even see them be borderline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's, you just, they go through all of that. And um, borderline personality disorder is a really complicated, difficult place. But one of the things that you'll see when you'll see that is when they're splitting, you know, the parents or the teachers or the teacher and the parent, and they're making one all bad and one all good, you know, it's that all or nothing thinking. So the thing about the hormones is it makes everything more extreme. So it's a really good question about high sensation seeking HSPs or teenage highly sensitive people. They do still have the urge to experiment and to, to push the limits. And one thing that I find a little frightening with in our world right now for highly sensitive children is all this talk about microdosing with hallucinogens. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of interesting evidence about using hallucinogens in microdosing with psychological treatment. But you can just imagine your highly sensitive teenager reading a, a book about it or probably seeing a YouTube video about it and then saying, wow, that's fascinating. I wonder if I could really manage my anxiety by microdosing on psilocybin. Hmm. <laughs> so it's really important that we talk to them about developing brains. And, but the reason that we're gonna not have as many problems with drugs and alcohol with our highly sensitive teenagers, even the high sensation ones is because they're thinking about it. It's the bottom line is they're thinking all the time about you know what, what their peers are doing. As I kind of said in that video about the seven-year-old, you know, that thought will be in her brain as long as we keep reintroducing it throughout her childhood. So it's really important to actually talk to them about it and then give them all the details. But they're going to be thinking about, you know, if they have a beer, they're going to think about what, what it's done to their brain, whether they like it or not. I hear lots of sensitive kids say, you know, I, I really didn't like the way it felt when I tried weed. Mm -hmm. So I think we're less likely to see addiction, even in families where there is addiction. You know, if there's, this is an education for all teenagers. If your family has any alcoholics or addicts in it, any, the addiction gene, it's genetic. We need to teach them that it is genetic and that they have a predisposition and that each three years basically that pass, if you, if you try alcohol or drugs by age 15, you're, and you have addic the addiction gene, the addict gene, you are something like 95% more likely to develop a problem yourself. And if you wait till 18, then you're 85%. These are not exact numbers, but ballpark. But if you wait until 25, then you only have a 70% chance. So probably in this world, we're not going to get kids to wait till 25 to try hmm. drug and alcohol. But with our highly sensitive children, we can give them lots of information and details and they will take that and run with it. It'll be really helpful to them to, um, to have that information. So the other piece I'll say about it is um, these children, all children need the challenges I was talking about earlier. High sensation seeking children need it a lot more and teenage children need it a lot more. So what does that look like? Knolls or um, outward bound? Um, I convinced my child when he was, when he turned 18 senior year to get his, um, to become a certified EMT. It was really challenging um, the, to go rafting down the Grand Canyon or um, they all need jobs. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Even, even your older son, it can start with community service, dog walking, babysitting, um, you know, mother's helper, anything like that. But they all absolutely must have adults in their lives and they must be acting like adults. Mm-hmm. My God, like, are you talking to my teenage self or are you talking to me about raising my kids right now? You know, all the same, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Hey, you know, we're, we're pretty far into this and, and getting to the yeah. end. Of our, I want to give the, the information about how to get your discount. I saw there was another question that came yeah. in. Yeah, in Zoom. Do you want to? Could you yeah. read it to us yeah, while course. I find this, the information? Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for the question. I have an HSB 16 year old who is depressed, but still doing quite well by most standards. She just started therapy and the therapist within two meetings of her worst mood wants to meet with her doctor to medicate her. I'm really concerned to start this process and what it would indicate for her future. I was hoping her opening up and support within therapy would help her get through her hormones and pandemic. Yeah. Well, I think here's the thing. Antidepressant medications are amazing. They work really, really well. And um, we really, we're a big, Elaine and I are a big fan of them on really small, speaking of microdosing, really small doses. So it's not a horrible thing, but I I would be, I would be wondering what is the therapist's level of concern? You know, is, if your daughter is starting to be, um, to barely function or is having some suicidal ideation, um, is not able to go to school, then um, a medication intervention might be a good idea. But it seems a little early for me in the second session. Like, I feel like, is does she have the depression lens, the Medicaid depression lens, this therapist? Or is there such strong red flags that that's why she went there? So I'm not opposed to medication. And generally, we can do amazing amounts of intervention around depression and anxiety for sensitive youth and adults. If If we can get them moving more, if we can get them sleeping more, and if we can get them eating better and also uh, doing a lot of supplements. So if you can, um, if this parent can pursue an alternative medical intervention and, you know, I'm having most of my teenage clients get treated with acupuncture as well and getting a lot of help from that. Um, so it's really hard. I, I hope you'll um, reach out and get some more consult on that. Let me get us back to tell you how you can get 15% off where Julie and I are going at this for 75 minutes at least on Friday. And we'd love to see you there. And this, let's see if I can advance the slide. Um, there are two ways that you can get 15% off. One is you go to this website, elainefriend.com, myname.com slash contact and fill out this little form and in it put prevention. The word, all you have to do is the word prevention. And we will email you back a 15% discount code to use to register on Eventbrite. So you have to do this by midnight Monday. So when, when um, Hua Mi, my amazing assistant, wakes up Tuesday morning and gets and looks at it, then, and I see the math, I ask them to make math because I'm a mathematician, I love math, um, to see that you're not a robot. <laughs> so, um, so please just go to this, elainefriend.com slash contact, throw in the word prevention in the comments. You're welcome to tell me more and tell me you'd like to schedule a call if you'd like. Um, and the other way that you can really do amazing, you can save so much money, <laughs> you could get two workshops for $37 by joining the membership. And this website, I have the, I'm going to put it in the chat, but I'm going to tell you it's bit.ly slash R-U-H-S-P. So it's very easy, bit.ly slash R-U-H-S-P. And if you just go there and join that membership, what will happen is you'll automatically be registered for all of my workshops, including our one on um, on Friday. And for as long as you stay, I mean, you can unsubscribe, you can just do Friday. And then I was going to tell you that our April workshop, I'm really excited. I just um, wrote up the description on that is called Sanctuary and Spirituality for Highly Sensitive People. And um, so that would be included. So I think that's, I'm really excited about that. So is that clear, Julie? Mm, it's great. What you, what you have to do to get the discounts. Yeah. I'm going to one way or another, copy this thing into the, into the chat and I'll put it in the Facebook as well. So you have until Monday midnight, your time zone, whatever it is to send us that note. And when you do that, we will reply with a discount code, or like I said, you can join, there we go. 
Um, if you're curious about Friday's workshop and you'd like to bring your questions, we already have some amazing questions coming in. You can email our, your questions in advance if you want or put them in our members only doc if you become a member. And to register for that workshop, if you're not a member, you only have to register if you're not a member, is the link here in the chat. And again, I will put those on Facebook in a moment. Let's stop that share. Okay. Great multitasking. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julie. I'm so excited to dig back into those questions we didn't get to last month and all the new questions that people will bring on Friday. So we hope to see you there. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. It's a pleasure and a gift to be here with you. It always is a pleasure to be with you. So we'll say goodbye for now and look forward to hearing from you all. Thanks. Bye, everyone.